Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I hope that you're well. Today is Wednesday. It is the 8th of November. It's Rabbi Akiva Mails, and we're getting ready for Parsha Chai Sara. Uh, before I begin, Parsha Chai Sara always holds a dear place in my heart because Chai Sara was my bar mitzvah Parsha. That's right. It was the fall of 1987 that I ascended that bima as a 13-year-old boy and became a 13-year-old man. So <laughs> Parsha Chai Sara <clears throat> has a special place in my heart. So uh, having said that, I want to share with you a number of items on Parsha Sky Sara that I hope will make your appreciation of the Parsha more meaningful. I know that it definitely has done so for, for me. So let's start right at the beginning. The Parsha begins at the beginning, telling us, Vayihiyu chaye Sara. And the, here is an accounting of the life of Sara. Mea Shana, she lived for 100 years, Asrim Shana, 20 years, Yesheva Shanim, and seven years for a total of 127. Shnei chaye Sara. And repeats it again, saying that was the years of Sarah's life. Seems redundant, right? The Pasuk begins, Vayu Chaye Sarah. We're about to tell you about the life of Sarah. It's 127 years. And then it says again, Shnei Chaye Sarah. Oh, yes, that's the uh, years of life of Sarah. We'll get to that in a minute. The Pasuk says next, Bez, Vatama Sarah be Kiryas Arba, that Sarah passed away in the locale of Kiryat Arba, Hi Chevron, which is synonymous with Chevron, Be'eretz Canaan, in the land of Canaan. So then Avraham arrives to eulogize Sarah and to cry over her. So we're going to take a look at that first Pasuk. As we pointed out, there some, seems to be something a little redundant and repetitive, both redundant and repetitive. So it says in that first Pasuk again, we're about to tell you how many, about the life of Sarah. It was 127 years. That was the amount of years that Sarah lived. Seems extra. So let's see, I want to share with you a beautiful point from Rav Avram Yaakov HaKohen Pam Zatzal. Rav Pam had a beautiful, beautiful way that he would he would share something uh, about this Pasuk. And we're going to see that together. So let's see. The Pasuk says this file. Let's see what Rav Pam says. It says, uh, this was from what, um, someone, Rabbi Ozer Alport. I've quoted him before. Wonderful fellow who lives in Brooklyn. He puts together uh, Parsha Divrei Torah sheets. And uh, here is one that he put together a few years ago. And this one here, you'll, you'll see, uh, brings down a beautiful point about this Pasuk in the name of Rav Pam. So let's see. Parsha's Chai Sarah begins by recording. Let me scroll down for those who are online. Parsha's Chai Sarah begins. By the way, there's a picture of Rav Pam Zatzal together with his Rabbitson. You can see they were a, a smiling, very happy couple. And that is uh, later in their years of life. They had a profound amount of admiration and respect for one another. There are numerous stories about how they cared for one another. Um, Parsha's Chai Sarah begins by recording, Sarah's lifetime was 127 years, the years of Sarah's life, which seems redundant. If Sarah lived 127 years, isn't it clear that those were the years of her life? What is the seemingly superfluous expression at the end of the verse coming to tell us? Good question. So Rav Avram Yaakov Pam notes, that Rashi writes in 23.2, so that was uh, on that second Pasuk, that Sarah's death is juxtaposed to the Akedah, because remember the binding of Yitzchak took place at the end of last week's Parsha, Vayera, to teach that she, that the shock <coughs> she experienced upon hearing that her son was almost killed was the cause of her death. Realizing this, somebody might mistakenly assume that if not for this tragic turn of events, Sarah would have enjoyed many more years of life, or even decades of her long and productive life. To counter this erroneous conclusion, the Torah emphasizes that these were the years of life that Sarah was allotted. And if not for this episode, she would have died in some other manner at the exact time. So that's what Rav Pam says the Pasuk is telling us. How long did Sarah live for? 127 years. Let's make it clear. 127, that was the amount of time allotted for Sarah. Even had the Akedah not occurred, she would have passed away at 127. Don't point to the Akedah and say, oh, if Avram wouldn't have done that, she wouldn't have died. It's not true. God gave her 127 years, and that was the, the means that the 127 came to an end at the Akedah. But had it not been for Akedah, something else would have happened. Never she would have had a heart attack. Something would have happened. Don't make the mistake of thinking it was the Akedah that killed her. It goes on to write, Rav Pam often used this message to comfort those grieving the loss of loved ones. 
It often seems that if the doctors would have only tried a different treatment, or if an accident could have been averted, the relative would still be alive. Painful as every loss is, Parshas Chai Sora teaches us that each person is given his own uniquely allotted lifespan, and nothing we think could have done differently could have prevented this person's death from one cause or another. Uh, we've all met people like this who torture themselves, thinking that maybe I made the wrong decision. I, I didn't take my loved one to the right uh, physician. I, I didn't pursue the right course of action. And that could eat a person up alive and that could just ruin a person. And what Rav Palm was pointing out from this Pasuk is it's not how it works. We believe there's a God, there's a Kodesh Baruch Hu. Everyone has a allotted number of years. We do our best that we can do. If we've done our best to maintain life, then stop second-guessing ourselves. HaKadosh Baruch Hu decreed this is when the person's life is coming to an end. As long as we're not grossly irresponsible, we have nothing to blame ourselves for. And he would use this to tell people when he would visit them upon the loss of a loved one to get themselves out of the slump that they were in, get themselves out of the depression they may find themselves in, stop second-guessing themselves. Let's go to page two. He brings down something here phenomenal. Along these lines, it's a prop, uh, it's a apocryphically said, right? There's there's like a a a mushal that's out there, or there's a story that's out there that when the Malach Hamavas, the angel of death, received his da- job, he complains to Hashem that he'll be universally cursed and hated for his actions and requested a different assignment. Meaning the Malach Hamavas is just an angel up in Shemaim, up in the heavens. And Hashem says, okay, your job is going to be that when it's a person's time to go, you're going to be the one to take the neshama. So the Malach HaMavis goes to Hashem and says, no, you can't do that to me. I'm going to be so despised. I'm going to be so hated. Give me a different job. So Hashem replied, don't worry. No one will ever blame you. They'll always attribute it to the heart attack, the car crash, the illness. Part of our belief and trust in Hashem is to internalize that a person does not die because of anything written by a medical examiner. The true cause of death in every single case is that Hashem decided the person's mission was complete and a time on earth has come to an end. It's it's hard for us to remember that because we take control of every aspect of our life. It's hard for us to remember that HaKadosh Baruch Hu runs the world and we don't know why this person's life was deemed to end on this date. As long as we weren't grossly irresponsible, there's nothing to be blaming ourselves for. This is when HaKadosh Baruch Hu said it's going to end. And that was, that's in this joke, so to say. That's what he says to the Malach HaMavis. Don't worry, no one's going to hate you because no one's going to blame it on the Malach HaMavis. Everyone's going to beat themselves up and say, oh my gosh, it was this decision, it was that decision, it was this choice, it was that choice that caused the person to die. And they won't put, they won't attribute it where it really belongs, which is with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That's again, it's, it's, I don't want to call it a joke. It's a, it's a uh, old saying, it's an old expression that was out there, but that fits in link in, in line with what Rav Pam was saying, that the message of the first Pasuk of the Parsha is, Vayushnei Chaye Sarah, 127 years, Shnei Chaye Sarah. That was the amount of time uh, allocated to Sarah. Even if there was no Akedah, she would have passed away at 127 years. Something else would have happened. That was when it was time for her ticket to be punched. And that's something that we have to remember. And, and it could be a helpful tool when we meet families who are grieving the loss of a loved one and sometimes might be racked with guilt and, and, and second-guessing themselves. This is a very important point. After seeing this in Rav Pam, I saw almost an identical idea from the Tosefes Bracha. Remember the Tosefes Bracha, we quote him very often, is Rav Baruch HaLevi Epstein, who was also the author of the Torah Tamima, and a son of the Aruch HaSholchan, who was Rav Yichil Michal Epstein. So he wrote, aside from the Torah Tamima, he wrote another commentary to Chumash, was called Tosefes Bracha. He wrote that later in life. And let's look at what the Tosefes Bracha says on this Pasuk. You'll see, it's, it's almost identical to what Rav Pam was teaching. So let's see, Shnei Chai Yisorah, Lo Nisbar Alma Ba'al Lashon Zeh, we're on page two. It's not clear, why does the Pasuk repeat this? It seems redundant, right? The Parsha began saying, Vayu Shnei Chai Yisorah, Vayu Chai Yisorah, it was the, here is the life of Sarah, 127 years, Shnei Chai Yisorah, that's the amount of years Sarah lived. Shkoch, we just were told that. Why does it repeat those words, Shnei Chai Yisorah? So, so the Tosef Esprach is bothered by the same thing Rav was. We can explain this based on what the Medrash says, and that's what Rashi cited in Pasuk Beis. What was the incident that brought about her passing? The Satan told her 
that Avraham brought Yitzchak up uh, as an offering, and whether he said he had a close call or that he actually went through with it, and that threw her into a state of shock, and that caused her to pass. That's what the matter says. It seemingly attributes her death to Akedas Yitzchak. Avalanan Kaimalan, but we know, and we know that the the our emuna, our understanding of Hashem's involvement in this world is the inish below zmane ain't no mace. If it's not a person's time to die, they're not gonna die. That's what the Gemara how it words it. The inish below zmane, it's not a person's time, ain't no mace. They wouldn't die. In Cain, Thomas below zmana. It's impossible. It cannot be that just based on shock and her fear, she would have died, and it wasn't her time to go. And that's what the Pasuk is saying. This is the amount of years that were allocated to her. What we just said here, 127. 127. We don't know why God decided she's going to live for 127 and not a day longer. And when the Satan told her, that that the Akedas Yitzchak occurred, and that's what may have caused her neshama to go. All that was doing was bringing about that the allocated time for her was going to come to an end. But had it not been for the Akeda, if the Satan didn't have that news to tell her, there's a million other ways she could have passed. It could have been a heart attack, it could have been a stroke, there could have been any other things. There could have been a car crash hitting her tent, whatever it was, there could have been a million ways for her to go. Her time, Hashem and his wisdom said, Sarah was only going to live for 127, and when that time comes, it's the Malach HaMavis' job to take her neshama. So how did it happen? Okay, the Sultan told her about the Akeda Yitzhak. That does not mean that if the Akeda Yitzhak had not occurred, Sarah would have kept on living. Something else would have happened, and that's what the Pasuk is emphasizing. So this is really exactly Rav Palm's point. So Rav Palm is making this point, but it's really the Tosefus Bracha said this earlier than him. And for all you know, there could have been other sources that said this as well. I think this is something that, again, we know to be true, but we need to remind ourselves of every now and then because of the fact we're just not used to this. We don't see HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We know he's there and we have our bitachon, we have our emuna, we have our faith, we have our belief that he's controlling our world, he's pulling the strings, but because we can't visualize him, because we don't see him, sometimes it gets, the stock gets away from us. And a person could really become racked with guilt about the decision he or she has made, about the care of a loved one. And it's important to remember this, unless someone was grossly irresponsible or negligent, we don't blame ourselves. We did what we're supposed to do. We followed our, we did our ishtablos. We took a person to doctors. We got a responsible course of medical treatment. As long as we've done that, there's no reason to feel guilty. And it's just self-destructive. This is what Rav Palm would say to people to get them out of their funk. And here's, we see the Tosefus Bracha, uh, a generation or two before Rav Palm, uh, going ahead and having the same, same idea. I thought that was very, very interesting. And it's a, it's a good tool to have in our tool chest because it's something that we could all it's something that we could all need, and we never know when it could help us. We never know when it could help somebody uh, somebody that we know. And again, it's not limited just to people dying. If we really believe that everything that occurs in our world is ordained in, in heaven for that to happen, if we weren't grossly irresponsible, as long as we're going about life in a responsible fashion, there's no reason to be beating anybody up and second-guessing ourselves in a terrible way. It could be about some career decision that was made, whatever it was, uh, an investment decision that was made. Stop beating ourselves up. As long as we weren't grossly responsible, as long as we were we were acting in a, in a in a reasonable, responsible fashion, then we have to just say, look, this is what Hashem wanted. And, and uh, I don't know why, but the, he wanted me to experience this loss, financial loss, whatever, this setback, whatever that may have been. Okay, we're going to see two more ideas this morning, and I want to give credit where credit is due. I saw these ideas, uh, my, my friend Rabbi Shimon Feder in Florida, uh, in his Sefer, we, we've quoted it a couple of times in the past, it's called Psychology and Personal Growth in the Torah. So he, I saw two beautiful ideas that he brings down, quoting uh, sources that bring these out, and I want to look at them with you because I thought they were really nice. So let's see. A little bit later in the Parsha, after Sarah Yimenu passes away, Avram needs to bury her. So we're told about, in, it's all in Rishon, in the first Aliyah, we're told about this experience that goes on. He goes to the Bnei Ches, those are the, the uh, descendants of Ches, 
he might call them the the Chitim, the Hittites. He goes to to them and he starts asking them. The, the, he's dwelling in their area near Kavron. He wants to purchase land so he could bury uh, Sarai Menem. And he speaks to their nobles and they tell him, and he tells them rather, Avram says, I want to speak to the head honcho here who is Ephron Achiti. He's the one in charge. And he's the one who he does end up uh, um, dealing with to eventually purchase what we know as Maras Hamach Pela, that, that uh, cave, what's called the Cave of the Patriarchs, that, that uh, double cave that becomes the burial place for our Abbas and Imahos. So let's see, the Pasuk says as follows. So he first approaches, I guess, the lower delegation. He doesn't go right to Ephron Achiti, the head honcho, right away. He goes to, I guess, a lower strata of their leadership. And he says to the Bnei Ches that he wants to bury her. And here's how they respond. Adoni, Listen to us, our master. You're a prince of God in our midst. As far as we're concerned, you are just uh, a, an incredible sterling individual. You reflect God. You reflect godliness. That's how they. That's how they uh, remark about Avram Avinu. In the choicest spot is where you should be burying your your dead one. None of us will withhold a grave for you to bury your dead. In other words, you name it. You pick whatever spot you want. And it's yours. We'll, we'll sell that to you. And Avram then says, okay, let me speak to Ephron. And that's where he wants to buy the Mars Machpela from. So they refer to him, though, in this very respectful fashion. They say, They say, Listen, they first call him Adoni, our master. And then they say, You are a prince of God in our, in our midst. So they're showing Avram a lot of respect. Let's take a look at something. And we're going to build on this. Later in the Torah, in part in Sefer Vayikra, the Pasuk tells us as follows. It's in Parak Yud Ches. It's on the bottom of the page, on page two. Parak Yud Ches, that's chapter 18. Pasuk Gimel. Kemase Eretz Mitzrayim. So Hashem cautions the Jewish people. Kemase Eretz Mitzrayim, like the actions of the inhabitants of Egypt. I'm sure you shocked them about where you lived for all those years, those hundreds of years you lived in Egypt. Lotasu, I don't want you conducting yourself like the Egyptians. When you go into Israel, you've got to be on a higher level of conduct. Uchamasa Eretz Canaan, and according to the actions of the inhabitants of Canaan, Asher Ani Shama, the place where I'm taking you to live, Lo Sasu, I don't want you to behave like them. Lo don't walk in their statutes. So the Pasuk is equating, it's saying, and, and Rashi brings this down from the Medrash, saying the two most rotten societies at that time were in Mitzrayim, that was the place where the Jews had lived. And also the people who are living in command, the place where the Jews were going. And Hashem is saying, I don't want you to mimic their behaviors. I don't want you to emulate their actions. You've got to be conducting yourself at a higher level. That's what Hashem tells uh, uh, Bnei Israel through Moshe. Don't conduct yourself like the Egyptians. Don't conduct yourselves like the Canaanim. You've got to uh, conduct yourselves on a higher uh, playing field. And you've got to live on a, at a much higher uh, moral plateau. That's what the Pasuk says. Let's see one more Pasuk, and we, we'll need this in order to see the Medrash. And this is in Sefer Bamidbar. This is in Shlach, when the spies are going in and charting out Eretz Yisrael. It says, Vayalu Benegev, we're on page three. It says that the, the Meraglim, the, the scouts, they go, they start in the southern part of Israel and they go north. Vayalu Benegev, they went up, starting in the south. Vayavoad Hebron, they go to Hebron. There were these three very mighty people living in Hebron. Achiman, Shesha, and Talmai, descendants of giants. The Hebron, and now gives us a, an additional piece of information. Hebron, Sheva, Shonim, Nivnesa, Lifnait, Soan, Mitzrayim. By the way, you should know Hebron, the city of Hebron was built seven years before Tsoan, which was a very famous town in Egypt. Okay, let's put this all together. So we're going to see here the Medrash called the Torah Kohanim. The Torah Kohanim is one of the uh, is is one of the early midrashim. I believe it's also known as the Safra. There's the Safra and the Safri. So this is the Safra. So the Safra is also known as the Torah Kohanim. So this is the Torah Kohanim is a very early midrash. And let's see what he says. So we're at the top line where there's the vav in parentheses. Rav Yosi Aglili Omer. So again, he's going in Parshas Achrei 
he's going in uh, that pasuk, that pasuk that said that we shouldn't conduct ourselves like the Egyptians or like the Canaanim. So Rabbi Yosei Aglili Yomer, Rabbi Yosei Aglili taught, if the pasuk, if the verse equates the actions, the lifestyle of the inhabitants of Mitzrayim to the lifestyle and the actions of the inhabitants of Canaan and vice versa, they were all just as bad. The people who lived in Canaan were as bad as the people who lived in Mitzrayim in Egypt. And the people who lived in Egypt were just as bad as the people living in Canaan. If that's the case, if that's the case, if they're all equally rotten, what made the Canaanim spiritually worthy to sit in tranquility to sit in tranquility for an additional 47 years over their, their companies, their partners in crime, their fellow degenerates in Egypt. In other words, if they're equally as bad, the inhabitants of Canaan are equally as bad as the inhabitants of Mitzrayim, and vice versa. And that's why the Pasuk has to caution us. Don't behave like the Egyptians, don't behave like the Canaan. They're both rotten. Well, if they're both so rotten, what merit did the Canaanim have that they were able to sit in Hebron for 47 years uh, in more tranquility than the Egyptians did? How do we know that? Shanemar, the Pasuk says, V'chevron zayin shanim nivna salif neitzon Mitzrayim. That so uh, the Hebron was built and it was, it was an existing city for seven years before Tzohan of Egypt. So let's just put this straight. What does that mean? They had an additional forty-seven years. Well, think about this. Hebron was built seven years before Tzohan, which was a major city in Egypt. Which means Hebron, right off the bat, has seven years extra of of living in tranquility than the Egyptians because they had that seven years of existing before any cities were built in Egypt. But then they got an additional forty. Because Mitzrayim was wrecked uh, during the Exodus, whereas the Canaanim were not wrecked for another 40 years till Yoshua comes in to start going to war against them. So that means there was an additional 47 years that the inhabitants of Canaan, not just Hebron, but the inhabitants of Canaan, Hebron is, would be, we know was built seven years before so on. So there's at least 40 years of a reprieve that the Canaanim had. But if you were a Hebron dweller, it's 47 years because it was seven years before uh, Mitzrayim. So the Medrash wants to know if they were equally as rotten, if their activities, their crimes were just as bad, how do you explain the fact that in God's big system of justice, how do you explain the fact that the Canaanim were able to sit in tranquility for 47 years extra over the, what the Egyptians had. They were both equally rotten. What did they do to merit getting those extra 47 years? So let's see what the Medrash answers. The Medrash answers as follows. It's on that third line, three words from then. Ella, what merit did they have? Bishvil schar shekivdu Avram. It was in the merit of how they were mechabed. They showed honor to Avram Avinu. Sha'amru lo, they said to him in Parsha Shai Sara, our Parsha, Shma'enu Adoni, listen to us, our master. Nasiyalo came at Tabasokhenu. You are a prince of God in our midst. So because of that, Bene Adam Shikivdu as Avramavinu. If you had human beings who showed such covet, such respect to Avram, Zahu Le Shev Baratsam Sheva Varbaim Shana. That's the only redeeming quality. In other words, the sages of the Mishnah are wondering what redeeming quality could the Canaanim have had that allowed them 47 years of, of peaceful living over the Egyptians. They were equally rotten. The Pasuk equates the two. The Pasuk says, don't conduct yourself like the Egyptians. Don't conduct yourselves like the Canaanim. They're equally rotten. They're both terrible. They're, they're bottom of the barrel uh, uh, societies. If that's the case, then what merit did the Canaanim have that they were able to sit in solitude and, and in peace for 47 years while the Egyptians were vanquished? And what you, the Medrash answers, the way our sages understand it is, you know what they had going for them? There's only one redeeming quality we could find. Hundreds of years earlier, their ancestors showed an incredible amount of covenant to Avram Avinu. They declared about him. First, they said, Shema'inu Adoni. They called him their master. They subjugated themselves. And then they said, Nesiyelokim Atabetzochenu. We recognize that you are a prince of God. They showed Avram an incredible amount of respect. Now, because they showed him this one-time event, they weren't Sadiqim. They weren't living a moral life. The Pasuk says that they were rotten to the core the same way the Egyptians were rotten to the core. 
but they showed covered to a tzaddik, they showed covered to a tamar chacham, they showed covered to someone who was representing Hashem and the Torah and all sorts of moral teachings. Because of the fact that they did that, Hashem says, now you've got zechusim, and I don't want you to use these zechusim in olam uh, ha'emes, up in, in the afterlife, up in olam haba. We'll give it to you in this world, and that's how they were zechusim, they have 47 years of living in tranquility that the Egyptians did not merit. What we see from this is a very, very powerful lesson. Sometimes we're wondering about, you know, showing kavod to someone who's a godly individual, whether that means a big tamar chacham, whether that means to someone who's a tzaddik, someone who's a, an incredible balches, and someone who makes a kiddush Hashem. If we show kavod to such a person, we're not just showing kavod to that person. We're showing kavod for what? It's not that person. It's about the office. It's who that person represents, the Torah that person represents, the God that person represents, the teachings that person represents. There is an incredible reward for showing kavod Torah. Kavod Torah doesn't just mean for a safer Torah that's in our own. Kavod Torah means showing respect for someone who's a living embodiment of the Torah. When we have a chance to show kavod to such a person, Let's jump at that opportunity because the rewards are awesome. First of all, it have an incredible impact. It could have an incredible impact on us and it could inspire us to emulate that person. But also when we go out of our way to show cover to that person, what we're really doing is showing cover for what he or she represents, which is the Torah and HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And the rewards for that can be awesome. So let's never miss that opportunity. And opportunities like that come every now and then. When there's a great personality who comes to town and we could be wondering, should I really go out and, and, and meet this person? Should I go out and greet this person? Should I go out and hear this person speak? Should I see what this person's all about? I've got other plans. I've got a game I want to go to. I've got something I want, to, whatever it may be. If we go out and we 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 engage and show uncovered to someone who's a living embodiment of the Torah, not only will we grow from this, but there could be some serious reward uh, coming our way for this. And that's what we see here. So that's that's really incredible. You really see the same idea in the Chizkuni. The Chizkuni spells this out in Parsha Sachremos as well. So the Chizkuni is one of our Rishonim. And you'll see he takes this idea of the Torah's Kohanim, of that early Medrash, and he kind of makes it his own. He says here, again, I'm on page three in the middle. So again, the Pasuk equates the evil activities of the Kananim and the Mitzrayim. So he says, again, it's the same Aglili that the Medrash quoted. Since the Torah equates, it says they're the same. The rotten activities of the people, the inhabitants of Egypt, and the rotten activities of people who lived in Canaan, and vice versa. What merit did the Canaanim have to live in their land? An additional 47 years. And again, because the Pasuk in, in Shlach in Sefer Bamidra says, that it was built seven years before. So that means they got seven years on the front end and they got 40 years on the back end because uh, they had all those years of living in security and peace while the Jews were wandering in the wilderness when the Egyptians were still licking their wounds. So he says, here he doesn't say because they uh, said you are our master and they said, it's because of the respect that they did. What was the respect? They allowed Avram to bury Sarah in the Maris HaMachpelah, which really goes back to Ephron. And to me, there's a bigger chiddush here because Ephron Achiti, he's known as the person who ripped Avram off. The, the Medrash, I'm sorry, the Mishnah uses him as the example of someone who's Omer Harbei Vaseh Ma'at. He's a big talker, but he does very little. He offered Avram initially, you can have Mars Machpel for free. And when Avram says, no, 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 I really want to pay something, he made him pay Arba Mayel Shekel Kesef Over La Socher. He made him pay the most expensive, the finest 400 silver coins. Big talker, Ephron. He says, yeah, between you and me, you know, I'll, I'll give you something. I'll give you a good deal. And what does he do? He charges them the highest price that could possibly be around. And he says, that that's a chus. But at the end of the day, he still let Sarah be buried there. He didn't have to sell Maris Machpelah, but he sold it to him. He was rewarded for that. To me, that's even a bigger chiddush than the matter. So matter says that it wasn't Ephron who was the Bnei Ches. They called him Shemenu Adoni. They called him a master. And then they also said to him, According to the Cheskuni, it's not the words that they used. 
it, what was the what, the what was the final deal that took place? Is they allowed Efron Achiti allowed Sari Menu to be buried in Mars Machpelah? He sold Mars Machpelah to Avram. That was what the reward was based on. Even though he ripped him off, okay, he ripped him off. But at the end of the day, he sold it to him. He didn't have to do that. If that's the reward that he got for doing a tova, for doing a favor for Avram Avinu, so we got to think to ourselves, what could be in store for us when we do a favor for another good, honest. Uh, walking Kiddush Hashem, someone like Avram Avinu, and we are mated, we we do them a favor, and we do it believe Shalek, we really do it with a full heart and with goodwill, the rewards could be uh, endless. So that's what he says, V'nis uh, Parsha Zu, why, why is this right here? She's uh, saying, okay, that, that's fine. That, that That's a separate point what the Chizkuni has at the end about why is this written right here at this point in Parsha Zachary most. But but his point is a lot like the Medrash, but I think it, it's slightly different. It's, it's even, a, in my mind, it's a bigger novel teaching. Let's see one more teaching. So this is on Parachaf Dala, the next chapter. The next chapter tells us, and I think there's something really beautiful here. The next chapter tells us as follows, that after burying Sarah, he realizes that his son Yitzchak is of marriageable age. He came very close to uh, ending his life with the Akeda, And he says that would have meant that uh, his his whole lineage would have come to an end. So it's time we got to find a, a marriage partner for Yitzchak. So the Pasuk says, Avram Zakein Baba Yamim. Avram was old, he had gotten on in days. Bashem Berach is Avram Bakal, he was blessed with everything. Bez. So Avram has this conversation with his trusty servant, who was the elder of his house, Hamoshel Bakal Asherlo. And he really ruled over, he ran everything that Avram had. He trusted him like, like he was a brother. I want you to place your hand on my thigh, you're going to take an oath. Vashbiacha, last page, page four, that's verse uh, three, Pasuk Gimel. Vashbiacha, Vashem, Eloke Hashemayim, I want you to take an oath in the name of God, who's uh, of the heavens, Eloke Aretz, and the God of the earth. Asher Losi Kachi Shalev Nimi Bnosa Kanani. Do not find a Canaanite girl uh, as a daughter in law, as a wife for my son Yitzhak. Asher Nochi Yosheba Kibro. I live in their midst. I see what kind of rotten people these Canaanim are. I want you to go back. Himel Aretziva Malatati. Go back to my land, my birthplace, where he originally came from. So he's going back to uh, Babylonia, modern day Iraq, to go find someone from my family. That's you've got to find a distant relative in my homeland to be Yitzchak's wife. But I need you to take a promise about this. So we're going to see the Sefarno. The Sefarno is one of our Rishonim on the Chumash. And he's bothered by why, why did Eliezer, the servant, why did he need to take a promise? Why did he need to take an oath? So let's see what he says. So the Sfarno says of Avram Zakain, Hashem Berach Zavram, God blessed Avram with everything. Bira Sibo Shechrichu is Avram Lishlach is Avdo. The Pasuk is, the, the verse is spelling out for us the reason why he needed to send his servant, El Eretz Acheres, to go to a foreign land, Badi Shalavno, to find a wife for his son. And why did he have to make him take an oath that he would follow through on this? He was Sivas Azikna, because first of all, Avram was very old. Dog Sheyamus, he was nervous that he was going to pass away. He wouldn't see his son's marriage. That's why the Pasuk emphasizes, when is this taking place? When Avram was Zakain, he was old, he realizes, I better get moving on this. So he's making him take an oath. Get this done now. It's not five years from now. You got to get this done now. When we bleed in Bart, so Isha Aguna live no, and because there's no local girls that are fit to marry Yitzchak, because he's familiar with the rotten ways of the Kananim. So he says, Hutzrach Lishlach Laretz Acheres. I need to send you, Eliezer, to another land, to my homeland. We pray Ashro, and because I'm a very wealthy man, I know many people are going to want Yitzchak, they're going to want Yitzchak as a son in law to become a Mechutan, to marry into the family. Dog, Avram was nervous. Shema Eza Adam Bilti Hagun. Maybe there'll be some no good Nick out there. Yirba Shochad Labdo will bribe his servant, Eliezer, Kadesha Yimchar Bevito, so that Eliezer will choose his daughter to be the wife for Yitzhak. Meaning he's entrusting Eliezer, his faithful servant, to go on this mission to find the right wife for Yitzhak. But I need you to take an oath that you're going to get the right wife, that you're not going to be uh, um, uh, you know, persuaded Nothing is going to get in the way of clouding your vision, making certain that you're getting the person who's going to be the basis of uh, the foundation of Judaism, of the Jewish people. I need you to get a, a proper wife for Yitzchak. And I'm nervous. There could be people out there who really want to get into this family. They might bribe you. 
I'm nervous, Eliezer, you might succumb to that bribe. So take an oath. That oath is going to make sure you don't take that bribe. No, because if you take that bribe, you're going to give up on your mission and you won't work hard to find the proper wife for Yitzchak. So I need you to take this oath. That's why you needed to take an oath. Number one, I'm getting gold. I want to make sure you're going to get moving on this now. Number two, the oath is you're going to travel back to my homeland. It's a hassle. I know it's a lot easier to find a local girl. I want you to take an oath. And number three, I want you to take an oath to make sure you're going to get a fitting wife, someone who's really a balas chesed, a kind person. Don't take any bribes just because some guy wants to, to uh, hand off his daughter to be um, one of the emos, to be Yitzchak's uh, wife. Now, that's astonishing, because what that seems to be saying is Avram had a real fear that Eliezer, even Eliezer, who he trusted, was Moshe B'chol Asher Lo. Look how the Pasuk introduced uh, Eliezer to us. The Pasuk said, uh, go back to page three on the bottom, Pasuk Bez, Vayomer Avram el Avdo, Zekan Beso. So first of all, who was Eliezer? He was his servant. Then it calls him Zekan Beso, the elder of his house, meaning he's been there the longest. He's had this really long relationship with Avram. They went to war together. Remember the free lot? They went to war together. They're like brothers in arms. B'chol Asherlo, he's a Moshel B'chol Asherlo. He trusts him over everything. He's the one who he obviously trusts. This isn't someone that you would suspect is really going to succumb to a bribe. Yet, what is this Farno telling us? No matter how trustworthy someone might be, when they are tempted, when they are tempted, when someone is trying to stick cash in their face and say, here's an easy way to become rich, even someone who's got a, a track record of impeccable honesty, they might succumb to a bribe, to taking a bribe. So Avram says, I got to make sure you don't do that. I'm going to need you to take an oath. If you take the oath, that might give you that extra protection you need to, to stay on the straight and narrow and not take a bribe. I, I think that's fascinating. Sometimes we tend to think, that uh, oh, I'm above that. I would never succumb to a bribe. We're human beings. And there's an innate weakness. And Avram understood this. Avram Avinu understood human nature. And he knows that there's an innate weakness that we all have for wealth. And if it could come easy with no strings attached, people might, the most honorable of people might do this. We've seen this time and time again. How many political scandals have happened when there are people who have uh, seemingly good people who have dedicated themselves to a life of public service who have succumbed to bribery of one form or another. How many people has this happened to? There are investigations that go on all over the place. You know, outside of America where there are no laws and no rules in many of these banana republic countries, it's just a given. You got to grease the wheels. You got to bribe people in order to get your way. That's just, that's what being an official does. You want to get to public office, so now you can become rich on bribes. That, that's what it means. In America, we hope that's not the case, but sometimes, unfortunately, that's what investigations uh, uh, find to be true. And we've seen throughout history some of the most noble politicians. People have really done great things. They've succumbed to bribery, and it's, it makes sense. They're human beings. This is an innate weakness we all have. Eliezer could have had this weakness. If Eliezer could have had this weakness, certainly our politicians can, and we can as well. If you want to see about what kind of a chiddush, who was Eliezer, look at this last source. So this is on uh, a little bit a little bit um, uh, earlier in the Torah. When the Brisbane Absarim takes place, so Hashem uh, promises uh, Avram, you, you're going to have so many descendants. So look what Avram says. So this is in, in Perak uh, Tesvav, Pasuk Beis. Vayomer Avram Ado, he says, Hashem Elohim, Matitan Li. What good is it? You're going to give me the land of Israel. You're going to do all this for Vanuchi Holei I'm childless. Uben Mesek Beis, Meshek Beisi, and the steward of my house, who da Meshek Eliezer. Da Mesek Eliezer is Eliezer of Damascus. So he calls him Ben Meshek Beisi. Now it looks like a play on words. The steward of my house is Damasek Eliezer. Eliezer is originally from Damascus, Syrian. So that's what it looks like he's saying. But the Gemara says, no, there's a little bit more going on. Why is he called Ben Meshek? Let's see. The Gemara tells us in Yoma a little bit about Eliezer. Eliezer Evet Avram, Zaken Vyoshev Biyashiva. He was older. And at the end of his life, he was just engaged in studying Torah, whatever that means, because it's obviously before Sinai. So whatever moral teachings Avram had, teachings about monotheism, whatever he was sharing with the world, that's what Eliezer was engaged in day in and day night, day in and day out. Shinamar, because what did the Torah tell us right here? Vayomer Avram el Avdo, Zikan Beso. He was the elder of his house. So we know Eliezer is an older person at this time. Hamoshel Bechol Asher Lo. 
that he was the one who ruled over everything Avram had. What does that mean, Amoshel Bechol Did it mean that he just was in charge of all his financial assets? I'm a Rav uh, uh, a Lazar. What did Rav Lazar teach? Shemoshel, that he ruled over Betoras Rabo. That he was, he ruled over, he had an absolute handle on all the teachings of Avram. Everything Avram was teaching the world, Eliezer was his spokesman. He could have taught everyone else. He was the ultimate um, you know, we had in yeshiva, there would be the, the Rebbe would give the shir, and then there would be an older fellow in the base medrash or in the kolal whose job was to help the younger guys understand the shir. Why? Because they understood it so good, they could repeat it to us. So this is the this is the role of Eliezer. He was Moshe Betoras Rabo. He ruled over the Torah. He had all the teachings of his of his Rebbe, of Avram Avinu. He had it on his fingertips. And then it continues with Damasic Eliezer. He was known as Eliezer of Damascus. And is Damasic also just uh, incidental? Yeah, he was from Damascus. Um, Rabbi Lazar, Rabbi Lazar says, no, that also means something. Shedola umashke mitoraso shel rabo lachirim. Shedola means like he would draw out, like someone goes to a well, they pull up the bucket. Shedola umashke, they would draw out and give to drink mitoraso shel rabo lachirim. He would, in other words, if Avram was busy, he was learning with the group, no problem. And then another group comes to the tent, to the base matters. No problem. Eliezer's got this. He's able to give over all of Avram's teaching. Uh, Eliezer was his right-hand man in every sense of the word. Not just that he trusted him with his possessions. Not just that he trusted him looking over all of his investments. Not just that he was his brother in arms, that they would go to war together. But he was also his spokesman. He knew all of Avram's teachings about monotheism, about ethics, about Torah, whatever that was at that point. And he was capable of sharing it with others. And he did share it with others about such a person, according to the Sepharno, Avram is saying, I need you to take an oath that you're going to go through on this mission, that you're going to do it swiftly, you're going to go back to my homeland, and then you're not going to take any bribes. What do you mean? Someone like this could have been capable of falling into bribery? Absolutely. He's a human being, and no human being is above this. This is just part and parcel of the human condition. We want to become enriched. That's part of who we are. We're all looking to be on easy street and we've all got bills to pay. We could all think of what we would do if we won the lottery, how I would use that money. We've all gone down that road before. So therefore we're all susceptible to one degree or another, unless we make a conscious effort, unless we do something to take a stand, to say, I'm not going to take a bribe. It's very likely that we could very easily fall into that trap. Avram's aware of that. And that's why he's making Eliezer take this oath. Not that Eliezer was a nefarious character. To the contrary, Eliezer seems to have been a tzaddik. He was the most faithful student Avram had. Even with all that, there's no guarantee that he wouldn't succumb to taking bribes. And that's what he's teaching us. So I think what we see from here is uh, there's an innate weakness we have as human beings. We want to enrich ourselves. That can show up in terms of taking a bribe. That could show up in terms of taking funds which are not ours. It's something that we need to be aware of. And we need to put safeguards in place to make certain that we all stay on the up and up. It's not just that rotten politician who's going to take a bribe and end up putting his hand in the cookie jar, skimming something off the top. That can happen to each and every one of us. Nobody should think my level of integrity is so great that it can't happen to me. It could happen to absolutely every one of us. So we need to take steps to make sure that we stay honest and that we don't put our hands where they don't belong and that that we end up being in the key kapayim, that we have clean hands, that our, our, our pockets are not lined with ill-gotten gains. So just to quickly review, we saw three uh, points on the Parsha this week. The first point that we saw had to do with Rav Pam and the Tosefes Bracha, reminding us that HaKadosh Baruch Hu runs the world. And all that occurs in this world is through his uh, directive. So we shouldn't beat ourselves up. We shouldn't second guess ourselves. As long as I have not acted in a grossly negligent manner, as long as I did what I'm supposed to do, I, I, I was a responsible person, I cannot beat myself up. If something happens, it was God's will. I can't second guess myself. Number two, uh, the, the second idea that we had was from that idea of what it means to be mechabed, to show covenant to, to someone who is a representative of God and to honor them, 
uh, that that has incredible consequences, incredible rewards. To do chesed for someone, even if there could have been some other motives involved, there was reward. So how much more so if we do chesed for another person, the lev shalom with an absolutely full heart. And then this last lesson is just to remind ourselves by the fact that Avraham Avinu required Eliezer to take an oath that he wouldn't succumb to bribery reminds us there's no human being, no matter how holy, no matter how righteous they seem to be, who is above the that flaw in human nature that we all want we all have another bill to pay we all have something we would do if we had some disposable income and if it looks easy and it looks like we could get away with it there's no guarantee that we'll be honest we need to put safeguards in place just to make certain that we all stay on the up and up and that we don't uh we don't end up with ill-gotten gains nobody should think they're they're beyond that each and every one of us are capable of falling into some kind of financial scandal with this in mind and, and we're when we're knowledgeable of this we can take the appropriate steps to make sure that we don't fall into financial scandal, that we don't take what's not ours, what's not coming to us, and that we all remain on the up and up and live a life of Kiddush Hashem where we are sanctifying uh, God's name. With that, I'm going to uh, end it right now, and I'm going to stop the recording, and I'll invite uh, anybody uh, who